All right, guys, this is our last chapter. We'll try to make this as painless as possible. We're going to look at chapter 14, which is evaluation, because you know what? We've done all this work, and now we need to make sure that we evaluate everything properly so that uh, we can adjust things and, and make it all better each time we, uh, we offer our education. So the first thing you have to do is make sure that you know who you were talking about, the audience, what the purpose of your educational task was. Was it uh, one person? Was it a group of people? Was it a patient? Was it um, a group of students? Um, a train the trainer session. So figure out who your audience was and what your ultimate purpose was and what the scope of it was. And then, you know, you got to determine um, what objectives she wanted met and what resources you had available and then when you kind of pull all that together you can figure out if ultimately the education that you provided was as good as it could possibly be. When you look at these things you have to ask yourself did I have enough time? Did I have the right materials? Did I use the best possible materials? Uh, was I able to get feedback from my my well in this case they call it client but your student whether it's a patient or someone in your classroom did you did you see that they had a confused look on their face and if they did did you use that as a teachable moment to correct whatever errors they had um, things like that you really do lose a lot of that when you work online I mean obviously I can't see the look on your face right now any more than you can see mine and so we lose part of our interactivity and so there are certain uh, tasks that are easier to do in person than online. And then um, think about the opportunities that you had in, in a given setting and ask your students also for feedback. We've spent a lot of time talking about your objectives and you really do need to know what your objectives are ahead of time so that you know when you've actually met them. And, and so determining what those are and if they're appropriate for you know your setting and your your students and the material and opportunities you have available is really really important so take all that into account and then figure out what your objectives are and then afterwards did you meet the objectives and if you didn't meet the objectives why not was it because the learners weren't prepared to learn was it the method that you used to teach uh, was it that you didn't have the right equipment you know there are a lot of different reasons why things don't go as planned but uh, this is an analysis a, a, an after-the-fact analysis to see you know how it went summative evaluations are more long-term so you're looking at this like out several months it can be six months that's that's the typical time frame but you can look at this longer for longer periods of time you know there are certain groups that you want them to be successful long term like long long term like for years and years and you know you got to go back and analyze to make sure that what you taught them didn't just go into the short term memory but into long term memory and that it resulted in a change of lifestyle if you teach someone how to read for example when they're young then it changes their life forever you don't stop reading you know you don't unlearn that it's like riding a bicycle you don't forget how to do it but you know six months from now if you don't read at all or you don't ride a bicycle then you may not be doing it very well when you try it so you know you really want to make sure that you have instilled in people a um, lifelong love of learning an impact evaluation looks at uh, the your foundational knowledge. Um, this is really important in programs like the CRS program for example where you need to learn basic skills as a, as a base to build on top of and so if you didn't learn skills first semester then you're not going to be successful in the second semester and ultimately you won't be a successful respiratory therapist so you really do have to um, definitely assure that your students learn this basic knowledge before you move on to the next. So you can do an impact evaluation um, during your teaching, uh, like um, competencies for example. You could do it at the end of a given time period, let's say the end of the first semester uh, or the end of the second semester to make sure that people are ready to move into the second year of a program. This is, these are just examples, but you, know, you make sure that you 
have a student who can demonstrate basic knowledge and basic understanding before you move on to more complicated tasks. You could look at this long term and say, for example, if people don't pass, uh, we'll say the written registry, for example, then you can make the assumption that they did not learn something along the way. And you can then break it down and look at different individual skills and see if you can pinpoint exactly where the breakdown was. So impact evaluations uh, can be big or small, but they certainly are um, a little bit more broad. Program evaluations are similar. Um, this is like the impact at the end of the program. We can look to see if everybody met the needs that we were after. So in our case, um, for the CRS program, it's always been really easy. All we had to do was look to see if people passed their tests at the end of the program. But you can look at other things too. For example, were people able to get jobs? Um, if you are teaching in a pulmonary rehab, then you can assess people's activity levels and their uh, health, their um, their lifestyle. You know, are they able to walk further than, than they were when they started? Uh, are they now able to travel with their oxygen? Uh, are they better able to clean their house or cook food? So there's a lot of different types of programs, and the evaluation ultimately is, determines uh, how well you did. Now, it is important to do program evaluations because Quite often, programs are affiliated with money. There are a lot of programs that are grant funded, especially since the Affordable Care Act went through. Obamacare, if you haven't read the law, and I think I've encouraged you to do this before, but I certainly will encourage you again to go ahead and read that entire law. There were a lot of programs that were in there, a lot of um, teen parenting programs, for example, um, health care programs of various sorts. They were like uh, programs if you're diabetic to help diabetic people learn how to control their diabetes. There were a lot of different programs. It was really kind of, kind of shocking to me how many programs were in there. But if you were one of the programs, smoking cessation, for example, that, that met the criteria in the Affordable Care Act, you could apply for a grant. Now, for the next three years, you'll get grant funding in order to meet the goals of that law, the Affordable Care Act. At the end of those three years, then you will usually have to reapply for the grant that you got. So federal grants, by the way, are almost always three years in nature. Uh, that's not to say that they don't renew. Sometimes they do, but you usually have to meet certain goals. You set the goals by yourself, by the way, most of the time. I mean, the, the Affordable Care Act will say, you know, we want parenting classes for teen parents. Then when you apply for the grant to get one of those grants for the teen parenting program, you're going to have to sit down and say, these are my objectives. Yeah, I want to make sure that uh, the teenagers stay in high school. I want to make sure that their children don't get taken away and put in foster care, that they are meeting their um, developmental goals, things like that. And so at the end of three years, you're going to have to go back and analyze all the clients that you dealt with to see if your program was successful in serving the objectives that you laid out and ultimately you're going to have to tell the government this is how it helps society. This is why it's a, a program worth funding. Now at the end of that time there may or may not be money to refund your program and there may be some program that the government agency that coordinates the grants thinks is more uh, appropriate but um, you know you can reapply and try. Unfortunately you can't uh, you can't reapply without statistics and basic information. So usually you set your own criteria, but you're going to have to follow through in order to get more money later on. So program evaluation can be uh, just for your own purposes, just to make sure you're doing a good job. You can use program evaluation to sell your program to other people. You can say, you know, this is how successful I am. So this is the bang for the buck you get. You know, if you want to go to Pima, you're going to spend three times more money than you you will going to CSN, uh, but you'll finish in a shorter period of time. Uh, unfortunately, you probably won't pass your test, but don't tell them that. So, you know, you, you can use it to sell your program to other people. You can use it to get grant money. You can use it for your own personal needs. Um, you can use it for your clients. There's a lot of different reasons you would use it, but ultimately, the only way to get better is to assess what you're actually doing today. I had education classes that taught me how to design whole programs. 
how to design courses. But I also had classes that were designed to show me how to evaluate what we did. So there are whole classes on this. So to give you one slide for this is kind of, you know, sad or even one short PowerPoint. I, I feel bad doing this to you, but you know, this is, it is what it is. You know, you're getting this really, this, this crammed crash course in, in the subject of education. And this is, this is how it falls out. But anyway, when you design evaluation, you should design it at the same time you're designing your program. Now when I say program, I mean, it could be your course. Uh, it could be, um, you know, your program like your pulmonary rehab. It can be a program like a, at the college, like the whole CRS program. It could be the first year of the program. You know, there are a lot of, I, I'm using the word program pretty broadly. But you have to design the evaluation at about the same time that you're designing the program itself. Or at least have an idea of how you're going to collect the data. So you, you have to collect the data in the same or in appropriate methods for the type of education you're giving. For example, if you're using a pulmonary rehab program, then you don't just want to get feedback from your clients. You also want to get health documentation. Were they able to walk for six minutes and go further after pulmonary rehab than before pulmonary rehab? So that's hard data that you really can't argue with. And if you're not familiar with those, um, if there's a six minute walk that they, they put you on a uh, put you on a sat monitor and have you walk around a gym for six minutes and they see how far you can go and how long you can last and at the beginning of pulmonary rehab some people cannot walk six minutes hopefully by the end of pulmonary rehab not only do you walk six minutes but you walk further at a more brisk pace so you know there's usually a pedometer involved and along the way we're documenting your saturation and you could do it with or without oxygen depending on what the patient needs are but anyway um, if you know that you're going to use the six minute walk as one of your evaluation tools, then you're going to have to do a six minute walk at the beginning of pulmonary rehab and another six minute walk under identical conditions, as close as you can get to the same conditions, at the end of pulmonary rehab. And then you can decide, did, did we make a difference in this person's life? On top of that, you can also give them uh, evaluations to fill out, you know, surveys, how did you like this on a Likert scale, one to five, what was your favorite part, what could we have done without? could do that. Uh, so there's hard data, uh, subjective and objective, I guess would be a good way to put it. So you have to figure out what methods you're going to use, uh, whether you're going to use a qualitative or quantitative analysis. Um, qualitative is, um, is more, more storytelling, uh, I guess is the best way to put it. If you're not familiar with uh, qualitative uh, surveys. I, I took a whole research class on qualitative research. It's more uh, if, if you're if you're going to go to the tribe in Africa uh, and you you're going to do an ethnography, meaning you're going to go live with this tribe in Africa for six months, and then you write a story about what your experience was like for six months with this African tribe, then that is uh, qualitative analysis. Quantitative. That's the hard data. That that's the objective versus subjective. So figure that out. Uh, figure out who you want to collect your data from. If you are working with patients, you may want to collect it from their doctor or from another healthcare provider. Figure out when and how you're going to collect the data. Are you going to do it uh, the beginning and the end? You definitely should have something to compare. The beginning, a baseline at the beginning, and then a, a final tally at the end. But you may want to collect somewhere in the middle also. And you may want to look at it six months out and a year out also to see if there's a long-term impact, back to the impact study. And then you also have to assign someone to not just collect this data, but collate it, pull it together, and write a report. Somebody has to be in charge, ultimately, of, of obtaining the data and keeping the data. There are a lot of barriers to evaluation. Uh, if you've ever been a student and you've been asked by a teacher at the end of a course to fill out a survey. You know, you, a lot of times people don't do it, the students don't do it, especially in college, they just, they feel like no one reads them. For the record, they do get read. For the record, they do make a difference. And I, for one, always want to see what they say because you know, I do want to get better. I want to give my students the best possible um, 
time. You know, I want to want to give them the the best I can. But without feedback, you really don't know where you're successful and where where you fail. There are a lot of times when students, in particular, don't want to give negative feedback because, especially if they're going to have this teacher again in the future, because they feel like uh, it will somehow be used for retaliation. That should never be the case. I, for one, regardless of what anybody thinks, I certainly I take negative criticism pretty well uh, because I feel like the negative criticism is usually more honest than positive criticism uh, or positive uh, compliments. But I know that uh, there are some people who don't take it as well as I do, and so I, unfortunately, it, it puts students in a bad position. So you should make a point to never put your students uh, in or your clients in a in a position where they feel either obligated to say something nice, obligated to say something mean, or they somehow fear retaliation. You should also make sure that your evaluations don't make them feel bad about themselves. So let's say you're doing a pulmonary rehab. You, you want to make sure you phrase the question so that they realize you are evaluating the, uh, the instructor and not them. Um, so if you say, can you walk further in your six minute walk than you could before? Well, it may, may make them feel bad about themselves because they might feel like they haven't progressed. In fact, they may have doubled the distance that they walked in that six minutes. They may be doing fabulous. But if you word it wrong, then it can make them feel bad about themselves. So you just have to have to watch that. Um, the easiest way to do this is to write your questions and then run it by someone else, um, another professional, especially someone with some experience. Um, or, if, you know, if you don't have that option, just run it by a total stranger who has, or I don't say total stranger, like a family member, something who has no idea what you're doing, because that sometimes is the best way to find out if the way you worded something will make your client, your student, your patient feel bad about themselves. Make sure that you ask very specific and clear questions. You will all recall that if you were in my class for any amount of time, you asked me a question at some point where I answered, it depends. That's my favorite answer. When I stop answering, it depends, it's because you have finally asked me a clear question, a clear and distinct question. So anybody who comes through my class should be pretty good at this, but it takes a lot of practice and it, 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 you have to learn it to be able to ask a good question. And you have to be able to get these questionnaires to people and, and collate and gather their responses. So if you can't deliver it to people, you can't expect them to return them. When you conduct the evaluation, you might first want to make sure that you conduct a pilot. Not always, but sometimes. Uh, for example, if you're using an online resource for the first time, like a SurveyMonkey, for example, you might want to pilot that before you put out the real deal, the real evalu evaluation at the end. Because if you don't, uh, if you wait, and then all of a sudden it turns out, you know, you decided, I'm going to do this. Um, end of program evaluation on SurveyMonkey, which is an online survey resource if you're not familiar with it. It's, it's a real common source for surveys because it's free and it's pretty easy to use. So let's say you're going to use SurveyMonkey. Um, so you send it out to everybody and then you, you sit back and you wait two weeks and it turns out no one responds to you. And it's not until after no one responds that you realize that either all your email addresses for them were wrong or none of them have computer access. Now in that case, you should have given a, a paper survey, but you, you may not know that. So it's kind of commonplace to conduct a, you know, a test first to make sure that the technology you're using is working correctly. And that, and that technology may be a stupid piece of paper. Um, it may be DataArc, because DataArc has a place where you can do a lot of different surveys for your preceptors in, in DataArc. But if people don't have a DataArc access, it doesn't do any good. No matter what you do, getting a survey re returned or getting an evaluation returned will take longer than you thought it will. However much time you think it's going to take, under any circumstances, don't double, triple the time. If you think it's going to take a week to come back, it will take three weeks. And I'm not exaggerating. Not just extra time. Give yourself substantially extra time. Give yourself three times more time than you thought you needed. It takes three times longer to write it than you think it does. 
and it will take three times longer to deploy it and get your responses back than you thought it would. And in the end, you really just have to laugh because number one, you're never gonna get the number of responses that you want. And number two, people are sometimes pretty mean and rude. You're just gonna have to put up with it. You know, when people are insulting, then you know, you just laugh it off. Um, one of the best evaluations I ever got said that uh, the, the worst criticism the student had of me was that I didn't bring enough candy to class. That stuck out because I thought it was pretty funny uh, considering I had never brought any candy. But you never know what people are gonna say. And don't take it personally. Think of this as business. When you're done, you have to write a report, otherwise, uh, or at least collate the data, otherwise it doesn't do you any good. You need to compare it to what you did before to find out if you made any progress. You may have to provide a report of some sort to an outside agency, whether it's an accreditation agency or a grant funding institution. You're, you may have to collate these results. So think about the audience that it's here for. If it's just you and you're the only one who's gonna see it, you still need to do something with this this information or didn't do you any good at all to go to the trouble of of gathering it so figure out who your audience is and then uh, if it's a, a grant for example there may be a, a pre-established format that you use for co-work accreditation for example there is a mostly a fill-in-the-blank report that you fill in there it's about 20 pages long and it consists of different tables that you fill in um, it asks you specific questions. It'll say, you know, the past three years, what changes have you seen and made? And so you may use a template that someone else provides. Uh, you may have to come up with your own. Just make sure it's clear and concise and that it answers all the questions that you needed to answer. For grants, they'll be very specific about what criteria they're looking for. Don't answer anything they didn't ask for. I mean, that's like going to court and answering questions that you didn't get asked in front of a judge. You know, don't put anything in writing that, you know, you don't want someone to go back and, and prove wrong. I mean, that's, let's face it, it's not like you're just uh, floating a boat here. You're asking for a lot of money in, in these cases or, or full program accreditation. You're asking for serious stuff, so take it seriously, but only answer the questions they ask. However, those questions that they do ask, answer them very thoroughly and clearly and concisely and don't make them come back and ask for clarification because to be honest, anybody who has to call you up and ask for clarification is gonna be irritated with you. And if that's the person who ultimately is reading your report to determine if you get more money or further accreditation, you really don't wanna upset these people. 